I am Loretta Mickley. I'm a senior research fellow in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, I study wildfires and all kinds of pollutants that emerge from wildfires and other pollutants in the atmosphere. I'm an atmospheric chemist by training. Yes, so smoke is composed of many different gases and particles. The particles tend to be very small. Um, we have a special name for them, PM 2.5, and that means particles that are smaller than 2.5 microns in diameter. This is really small. This is smaller than a human hair is wide. And uh, these particles, these tiny particles, can work their way deep into the lungs. They can cause inflammation, they can cause irritation, and the tiniest, tiniest of these particles can actually get into the bloodstream and travel through the body. Um, and while we know a lot about urban particles, urban PM 2.5, we're just now learning about smoke PM 2.5. Um, we're learning that smoke PM 2.5 can contribute to cardiovascular disease. Um, it can contribute to wintertime flu. It can contribute to adverse birth outcomes. And we even did a study here at Harvard looking at connections between smoke and COVID-19. So in the fall of 2020, there were massive fires in California um, and in Oregon. And at the same time, we were dealing with one of the waves of COVID. And we found that exposure to high levels of smoke actually increased people's vulnerability to COVID-19. So this was this is ongoing research and we're not anywhere near done yet looking at the links between health and smoke. Smoke also contains lots of gases. Um, some of the gases are emitted directly from the fire and some of the gases are made in the plume. And one gas that's made in the plume is ozone. We know a lot about ozone. We know it's very bad to breathe. But fires can contain a lot of hazardous chemicals. Um, and we're just now learning about those chemicals as well. Um, fires can burn structures, computer equipment, plastics with an array of deleterious toxic materials showing up in the smoke. So smoke is bad to breathe if you're in the vicinity of a fire, but one thing that we're learning is how far smoke can travel. So this was demonstrated most vividly for us on the East Coast last summer when Canada erupted in massive fires uh, including in um, Ontario and Quebec. And certainly that smoke was terrible for the people in that vicinity, um, especially indigenous people living in rural areas who were smack up against that smoke. But on some days, uh, the winds were just right that they funneled the smoke down to the east coast of the US. Um, and we experienced that in Boston, but especially in Philadelphia, in New York, and even as far south as Washington, DC. And this smoke, while it was only a few days, it affected millions of people. And we don't know yet what were the health outcomes of that. Maybe most people got through it fine, but there may be a large proportion of the population that suffered some consequence. There's also some evidence that there are microbes emitted by fires that may be bad to breathe as well. We think those that's a local effect and not a far-flung effect, but we're still learning. Um, one thing that's hard is knowing um, just how much smoke from far away affects a community many hundreds of miles downwind. Um, in the case of the Canada fires last summer, 
There was no question. We could see the smoke just funneling down. There was I mean, nothing else could have caused that. But with fires in the Western US, we can see from satellites that something's moving eastward, but we don't know where in the atmosphere that smoke is. Has it been pumped up above us or is it still at the surface? And while we have air quality monitors at the surface, those monitors can easily, cannot easily distinguish between smoke PM 2.5, for example, and just plain old urban PM 2.5. So it's very hard to know just how much smoke from a fire in Oregon, for example, actually reaches the US, or smoke from a fire in Western Canada, how much of that reaches the Eastern US. But it certainly affects people in the West, there's no question. Um, and we found that fires in California and Oregon are especially bad for air quality spread across the West and elsewhere for a couple reasons. Um, Northern California has big trees, lots of dense vegetation. So does parts of Western Oregon. And when those trees burn, that generates enormous amounts of smoke and the prevailing winds just carry the smoke eastward and around, also around the west. So those areas are really, um, they, they constitute the sort of chimney for, the, for what the rest of the U.S. experiences. The first thing they can do is just listen to any air quality reports for their neighborhood, their town, their city. If the smoke is bad, if it's unhealthy or hazardous, they should stay indoors if possible. They should, if they have them, turn on their air conditioners, their air, air filters, their air purifiers. We realize, however, that many, many people work outside Agricultural workers are outside. Construction builders are, work, are outside. And this is an issue. And we've actually tried to draw attention to some of the consequences of smoke for these people, especially the agricultural workers. We also encourage communities to consider uh, applying prescribed fires to their surrounding uh, forests or fields. Prescribed fire is fire that is deliberately set to clear out underbrush. I wouldn't try this at home, but I would encourage communities to allow government officials to plan these fires and to move forward with these fires. A carefully planned prescribed fires can clear out the underbrush and make a subsequent fire less dangerous, less extensive. So fires depend on fuel, they feed on vegetation. The less vegetation they have just lying around, particularly dead vegetation, the less they will spread. So we would encourage communities to welcome government plans to prescribe fires in their neighborhood, in their town. One thing that I should add is that masks can help. We all got used to wearing masks during the pandemic and you can bring out those masks when you're exposed to smoke. They will work very well. In recent years, we've observed real increases in fire activity. Not every year. There's a lot of what we call interannual variability, but we can see the area burned by fires ramping up over time. One study found that the area burned in forests has increased tenfold since the mid 1980s. And the question is why and what will happen in the future? Um, and we identify three possible regions, reasons. And the first reason is that 
It's just natural variability. We're just going through a fiery interval, maybe. Second possible reason is climate change. And the third possible reason is something we call the legacy of fire suppression. So I think I'll talk about the last one first. It's, we call it the legacy of fire suppression. So during the 20th century, um, the, the West became a kind of lovely, beautiful playground to live and to play in. People wanted to vacation there. We developed national forests, national parks, and land managers really discouraged any fire activity. The goal was to put out a fire as soon as it occurred. Now, indigenous people had burned their lands for cultural reasons as part of their heritage for centuries, but even that was squashed, no fire. The idea was zero fire everywhere. And that worked for many decades, but gradually over time, the vegetation built up and built up and built up. And certain landscapes that used to be a mosaic of grass or bare land and forest filled in. And what that has done is allowed fires when they do occur to just eat across the landscape. They have lots of fuel now. And we, uh, we think this is a big contributor to current fire activities. I have a postdoc doing ongoing research here at Harvard, trying to figure out just how much the increase in fire activity is due to this buildup, this legacy of fire suppression. It's a very hard question to answer. But we hope that in doing so, we will encourage land managers and communities to apply more prescribed fire to those places that have really built up over time. And right now, one place that we see this build up is Northern California. But that's just one reason why we think fire activity in the West has increased so dramatically. And the other has to do with climate change. So we know that no matter what causes a fire, what actually ignites a fire, whether it's lightning or um, arson or human accident or down power line, what allows a fire to spread is dry vegetation. If the vegetation is moist, yes, we'll get a fire, but it won't spread. But if we're if the fire encounters dryness, then it will shoot across a wider area. And so climate change brings years of drought to the West, and importantly, it brings higher temperature. And that higher temperature can dry out the fuel really well. So no matter what causes a fire, the fire can zip across this dry landscape. And we think that's a big contributor. And our most recent work points to climate change accounting for 50 to 80% of the observed increase in fire activity since the 1980s. This is new work. We've presented it in various places and we hope to publish soon. So this indicates that climate change has affected the past since the 1980s. What about the future? There are a couple approaches that we've taken to predict fire in the future. And perhaps the simplest to understand is to look at the past first, as we've already done, but to build, to develop relationships between meteorology, weather, and fire activity. 
And so we look at temperature, we look at relative humidity, we look at precipitation for different ecosystems in the West. Sometimes a really rainy winter can allow lots of vegetation to grow up. And then if that rainy winter is followed by a dry summer, all that abundant vegetation dries out. Along comes a lightning bolt or some kind of fire and whoosh, the landscape goes up in flames. So it's a very tricky relationship between weather and fire activity. And we've done many years of research looking into that. Then to determine what's gonna happen in the future, we turn to climate predictions for the future. We turn to an array or ensemble of output from different climate models because no model is perfect. So we try to get different climate models with different ideas of the future. All of them show warming, every single one of them. And then we take whatever weather those climate models are predicting and apply our relationships between fire activity and weather to that output. And we can determine or begin to guess what fire will be like in the future. And we find big increases, no surprise. By 2050, we find that the wildfire season could extend by three weeks. We find that smoke exposure could double across the West by 2050. We find that in general, wildfire and smoke will increase. And our work has importance because we're not just looking at the local effects of fire, the fire effects on structures, on displacement, on people's immediate lives. We're looking at how fires in the future can affect large swaths of the landscape, large um, numbers of people who live way downwind of a fire including people in the East Coast, people in the Midwest, people in the Southeast. So all these people are being affected by climate change in this way. I think only now people are beginning to appreciate this consequence of climate change. We've known about sea level rise, we've known about heat waves, but the smoke exposure is a new consequence, a new hazard from a changing climate.